Hello friends, welcome to video series on geography. In my previous video I explained about adiabatic latch rate and latent heat of condensation. In today's video I will be explaining about pressure belts and permanent winds. Pressure systems, ocean currents and wind systems have a great influence on temperature distribution on earth and all these factors are interconnected. Hence these factors greatly influence the climatic factors at various parts of the earth. Hence it is important for us to understand these major phenomena which influences temperature distribution on earth. The first ones are pressure systems. In pressure systems we will study about permanent winds as well because these two things are interconnected so we will be studying them together. There are total seven pressure belts one equatorial low, two subtropical highs and then we have two subpolar lows and then we have two polar highs. So what we see these are the polar highs at two at, the, at both the poles and then we have two subpolar low pressure belts one in the northern hemisphere and the other one in southern hemisphere. Likewise we have two subtropical high pressure belts and at the equator we have equatorial low pressure belts. So while studying these belts we will consider certain cases so we will be taking only some ideal, ideal situations in, instead of con considering lot of factors. So we will consider that both northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere has the same kind of land mass and oceans that is there is no differences in the area of land masses present into the both the hemispheres. And then we will also take into consideration that various factors that influence climates are same for both northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere that is there is no difference between various physical features. So under that, under such a condition, this is the way we see uh, the pressure belt system and wind system. And also we will we'll consider that there is no apparent shift of sun from season to season. So let us take that the apparent movement of the sun is only along the equ equator. It doesn't shift from Tropic of Cancer to Tropic of Capricorn. So in such a case, this is how ideally it looks both the pressure belts and the following winds. So what are the factors that control pressure systems? There are two factors, one is thermal factors, other one is dynamic factors. Thermal factors are nothing but variation in temperature. The difference in temperature between equator and poles give rise to certain pressure belts. These pressure belts are called as equatorial low which is formed due to greater temperatures at the equator. And then there are polar highs. This pressure belt, these pressure belts in both southern and northern hemisphere that is at the south pole and north pole are formed mainly due to a very cold climates that is due to less very uh, less temperature. So these uh, two pressure belts depend on temperature hence they are, the, they are the result of thermal factors. And then we have dynamic factors like pressure difference or pressure gradient force and then we have Coriolis force which is very important. Coriolis force is nothing but a force an apparent force which is a consequence of rotation of earth. So we'll see about Coriolis force in future slides. So the pressure belts like subtropical high and subpolar low are the ones which are created due to dynamic forces. So we'll see them in detail only then we'll understand these things. First let us look at basic concepts. Let us study the movement of air. There are two kinds of movements. One is vertical movement, other one is horizontal movement. Vertical movement is also called as convectional movement. I've explained before what is convection and the horizontal movement is called as advectional movement. So there are two kinds of vertical movements. One is called as upliftment when air, a parcel of air is uplifted from its original position and then we have subsidence where a parcel of air drops to the surface when its weight increases when it's in the top levels of atmosphere. So what happens in upliftment? When a parcel of air is heated, it becomes low in pressure compared to the surrounding areas. As a result, it is pushed topwards and the parcel of air moves upwards. I have detailed, given a detailed explanation in adiabatic last rate how a parcel of air moves upwards. So please watch that video. You will understand how a parcel of air moves towards the upper levels of atmosphere. So this upper level of movement of a parcel of air is associated with a vacuum like situation at the bottom that is at the ground level and this vacuum like situation is 
nullified or filled by the winds that are rushing from the surrounding areas we can see these winds are rushing from surrounding areas towards this region so this region is, is also called as a low pressure system or a low pressure center this is because uh, there is upliftment there is negative pressure which is created at this region hence it is a low pressure center and all the wind surround in from the surrounding regions gushes into this region and the wind doesn't come in straight straight paths but there is certain deflections so this deflection deflections of wind is mainly due to coriolis force and this deflection of winds creates a circular system of low pressure where the winds create a rotating or swelling motion of wind and this column of wind which is swelling is the wind that is uplifted so this is what convergence is in the other case we have convergence in the top levels that is what we see the convergence at the ground we have it's in it in the top levels so convergence gives rise to subsidence convergence in upper levels gives rise to subsidence and once the wind falls to the surface the exact opposite of convergence happens that is divergence in divergence also there is deflection of wind so wind doesn't travel in straight paths because of coriolis force so if you say if you take the uplift, upliftment process upliftment process is associated with cyclonic conditions so cyclonic conditions are nothing but a cloud formation that is cumulonimbus cloud formation and subsequent rains so when there is moisture in air and when this air is moving upwards there is condensation of water droplets which give rise to clouds and conden when condensation becomes severe then it falls to the ground in the form of rain so this is nothing but cyclonic condition it is also called as a condition which is associated with instability so upward movement is associated with convergence at the bottom level and this is associated with inst instability in the atmosphere so this area at the surface is called as a low pressure center and in the other case there is anti cyclonic condition where a parcel of air falls to the ground that is there is subsidence this subsidence is associated with a clear skies that is there is no formation of clouds this is because when air is uplifted it loses all the moisture in the form of cloud formation and rains hence when this air moves along the upper levels of troposphere it is completely devoid of moisture and hence when this air falls to the ground this has very little moisture and hence when there is no moisture there is no cloud formation and as the clear uh, skies appear very clear and when this falls to the ground it simply diverges at the surface without any rains or any instable conditions so it is a condition which is associated with complete stability and the movement of air at the bottom surfaces or at the low levels of troposphere is divergence so this is the difference between cyclonic condition and anti cyclonic condition so cyclonic condition is associated with convergence in the uh, bottom layers which is called as low pressure center anti cyclonic condition is associated with a divergence or a high pressure center at the surface of the earth so when we talk about horizontal movement or advectional movement it is mainly due to pressure differences we can see this is a high pressure center this is a low pressure center so there is a difference between pressures in these two centers hence wind flows from high pressure centers towards low pressure centers so this is horizontal movement that is the wind moves along the surface of the earth and it is called as horizontal movement but if you look at both horizontal and vertical movement the major driving force is difference in temperature when there is difference in temperature there is difference in pressures so this difference difference in pressures give rise to movements of air so this is how it looks in a three dimensional view we can see this is high pressure center at the bottom where there is divergence and here it is convergence we have a low pressure center so this swelling motion is due to coriolis effect so wind doesn't rush in a straight paths in, instead it takes a curvy paths this is because of coriolis force so what is coriolis force coriolis force is an inertial force or an apparent force apparent force simply means that it appears as if there is force acting on a body in real terms there is nothing such no such force it, it is only what appears to our eye and when we say it is an inertial force it simply means that the force acting on the body is due to its virtue or a virtue of motion or inertial position that is first we need to see what is uh, newton's first law to understand this according to newton's first law a body stays in its 
state state of motion unless there is an external force added to the body for example if a body is at rest it will be in rest for a long time when there is no application of external force and this state of motion continues as long as there is no external force which is there to accelerate or decelerate a body so if you take a body which is moving so it will be moving unless there is a force which is there to stop it or to accelerate it so it, its movement or its velocity doesn't change same when a, there is a body at rest it continues to stay in rest unless there is some force which is acting on the body to change its state of motion so for a better understanding we just need to look at these animations they are very clearly they have very clear explanation but before that let us see about the direction or deflection of a moving body in both southern and northern hemispheres so wind or any other substance which moves over a very long distances deflect towards its right in northern hemisphere and towards its left in the southern hemisphere so if a person is standing and is facing towards north then deflection would appear right so if a person is standing at the equator and is facing towards south pole then deflection would appear to be in the left direction so this coriolis force is important in understanding the circulating motion of uh, cyclones at the uh, low pressure centers or high, high pressure centers that is both divergence and convergence have a way a kind of spiraling motion this is because of coriolis force as you can see in this figure so coriolis force doesn't act on a body which is not rotating so the most important part of coriolis force is the rotation of the major body so without rotation there is no coriolis force let us take a, these two pictures for better understanding so in this picture we can see in the first picture how a body is thrown which is traveling a straight path that is its path doesn't change it travels in its own path but if we trace a path on the object that is rotating we will observe that there is a curvy path which is which appears to be uh, which appears to be the path of the object so this is nothing but coriolis force it is an apparent force what appears to the eye but in reality there is no such force acting on a body it is only just a path which is appears to be curvy because of rotating motion of this object so even the other objects explains this clearly we can see this is a circular disk two dimensional one and when an object is thrown from the center we can see it is it travels its own path but the intended de destination has already shifted by certain distance and as a result this movement doesn't appear to be a straight line instead there is a deflect deflection like thing ha appear the which appears for us that the path of the body is a curvy one not a straight one so this is nothing but an apparent force not an actual force so if you look at this figure you will have much better understanding this figure is very clearly explains how a body moving from north pole towards the equator appears to be deflecting if you see earth is rotating and earth has certain angular momentum or angular velocity which is greater at the equator hence equator is moving at a greater speed so imagine that a body is thrown from this point that is the north pole and it is and there is an intended destination which is at this point so which is moving along this black line so this is this should have been the actual path of the object but you can see as the earth is rotating when we throw an object this object up travels in its own path that is straight line but the movement for a person standing on earth appears to be deflecting we can see the blue line indicates the actual movement of the object which is a straight line but due to rotation of earth this is what the deflection or movement appears to be we can see this curvy path that, that is the red one this is how the path of an object appears to be when we see from earth so this is nothing but apparent force that is it is not happening in real terms it is only due to rotation of earth it appears as if the body is deflecting likewise when we throw an object from equator the same thing will happen but at equator there is different kind of force acting at equator we have a greater centripetal force that is outward throwing uh, force which is acting along the tangent of the earth's equator and we know that earth has angular momentum angular momentum or angular velocity which is quite great at the equator compared to at poles at poles angular momentum is completely zero there is only spin but there is no angular momentum that is the body doesn't rotate at the poles so at the poles there is no rotation there is only spinning whereas when we consider at the equator there is rotation as well as 
the axis spins on its own uh, orientation or inclination so if we take an object which is moving from equator it would have a certain velocity initial velocity which is equal to earth's rotational velocity and hence when this object is thrown from the equator it is usually follows its own path that is it has initial velocity and it will be moving at a certain at a certain speed along with the earth's equator and due to the rotating effect this path appears not as a straight line but it appears as if it is deflecting towards right so this is a matter of imagination so if you can imagine this thing it's easy but all the scientific stuff is not important for our exam it is only for understanding purpose but there are two important points which need you need to remember one is the coriolis force at the equator is zero that is a body doesn't deflect when it is at the equator but once it leaves the equator the body starts deflecting and the deflection is not so high about 5 to 5 degrees north and south of equator and hence there are no tropical cyclones in this zone whereas when we cross after 5 to 10 degrees we see intense tropical cyclones happening along around 20 to 30 degrees north and south latitudes so tropical cyclones are greatly affected by coriolis force and the coriolis force at the poles is maximum that is it is taken as one both at south pole and north pole so this is a very important point coriolis force at the equator is zero and coriolis force at the poles is one and we know that we have seen that in right in the northern hemisphere it deflects to the left uh, sorry right in the southern hemisphere it deflects to the left so this is true not only on a simple objects even it's true on the mov movement of waters when studying ocean currents we'll see how ocean currents are affected by coriolis force and imagine that a jet plane is moving on in the atmosphere even the path of jet plane seems to be deflecting because of coriolis force and coriolis force depends on two factors one is the velocity of the object when the velocity of object is greater it's uh, the deflective path we see is also great greater so when an object travels very slow even coriolis force is not usually observed but when a, an object travels is at much faster speeds then the coriolis deflection that is uh, deflection becomes much intense so imagine a body is traveling at certain speed it its deflection would be certainly comparatively low but if a body travels at much greater speed then the deflection would be much much higher so this is what how coriolis force depends on speed actually it's an apparent path uh, we need not worry about how uh, this thing happens and these are important properties of coriolis force so if this figure gives you a very good explanation if you have found the other ones hard you can see the the movement of the object is straight line so it doesn't deflect but the apparent path due to rotation appears as if the object is deflecting along this blue line so now let us look at various pressure belts and also we'll see at winds originating from these pressure belts and how these pressure belts are formed so we have seen that there are total seven pressure belts one equatorial and we have two each subtropical subpolar and polar highs first let us take a look at equatorial low pressure belt which is also called as doldrums because of the calm nature which is observed along this equatorial low pressure belt so what happens along equatorial low pressure belts we have seen that this is equator and let us consider that these are poles and this is sun the sun's intensity is quite greater at the equator hence the amount of heat received at the equator is highest due to great amount of heat received at the equator the air at the equator is uplifted we have seen in upliftment how upliftment happens and when this air is uplifted there is a negative pressure which is created at the bottom layers and hence winds from the surrounding regions come and occupy this layer and during this movement of winds winds just don't come and go this way instead they have a curvy path because of coriolis force and when these winds are uplifted they usually leave a gap between them where there is a calm condition existing so if you see the winds that are coming assume that this is equator and this is 5 degrees north and this is 5 degrees south so when winds such as this 5 degrees north and south latitudes due to neg negative pressure they start uplifting or moving towards the upper layers and hence there is no horizontal wind between these two latitudes that is 5 degrees north and south and hence this whole 
region that is what we can see in this blue line is uh, within blue lines is nothing but a uh, region with very slow or very ineffective horizontal winds as a result it remains calm for a long time hence it is called as doldrums so this is about equatorial low pressure belt so there is upliftment at the equatorial low pressure belt so and we have also seen that when there is upliftment there is cloud formation because of moisture content and also there is huge amount of ocean along the equator equator hence there is a lot of moisture available uh, for the cloud formation and subsequent thunderstorms so when there is cloud formation we have seen that there is cumulonimbus cloud formation due to accumulation of moisture and this cloud formation gives rise to huge amount of torrential rains or rains which la last for only few minutes but they are very heavy so this is the kind of climate which we see at equator all the regions lying along the equator mostly uh, if they are <coughs> very near to the oceans then they receive huge amount of rainfall and if the region is very interior of con at the very interior of continent that is due to continentality even if it's on the equatorial low pressure belt it may not receive rains because all the rain is exhausted at the coast or in the outer landforms when the air reaches interior it, it is completely devoid of, devoid of moisture because of uh, saturation before reaching such a certain place so we'll understand this later but just an explanation so if you see this is zone of convergence of trade winds trade winds are the winds which are blowing from flow, blowing from subtropical high pressure zone so we have surrounding the equatorial low pressure zone two high pressure zones from there the wind is blowing towards this negative pressure zone and this wind we can see it is deflecting towards its left because uh, its deflection is towards its right in the northern hemisphere and towards its left in the southern hemisphere and hence these winds travel from east to west and this east west movement gives them the name easterlies so they are also called as trade winds and also easterlies so these easterlies converge at equatorial low pressure and they are uplifted and they cause huge amount of rain at the equator so this is what happens and once the air reaches the upper levels they are completely moistureless because of all the moisture is lost in the form of cloud formation and rains hence this air which is reaching the top layers is completely dry and warm and as it moves away uh, it as it moves away from this region that is when there is divergence in the upper layers because of accumulation of this uh, dry air it falls at a certain regions on back to the earth this is because the air gets cold and denser as a result it falls back to the earth and this zone where the air falls is called as subtropical high pressure zone so at as we what we see here both subtropical high pressure zones other ones where there is subsidence of air so we'll see that later so these are extremely low pressure regions that is the equatorial low is an extremely low pressure region with calm conditions calm condition simply means that there is no horizontal movement of air but it doesn't mean that there is no rains there is abundant amount of rains in this region surface winds are generally absent and it is called as doldrums because of extremely calm air so trade winds are nothing but winds that are blowing from the surrounding high drop uh, high pressure systems into the equatorial low so they occur between 30 degrees north and south latitudes so usually high pressure belt is situated around 30 to 25 degrees north and south so the trade winds blow between high pressure and equatorial low and there are two kind two trade winds one is coming from the, the northern part other one coming from the southern part so they are both easterlies so th that is all about trade winds